reported. Hi everyone, welcome back. I hope you enjoyed your lunch. Um, we're about to start the third session of today. And I would like to invite um, um, Mrs. Sarah Dickinson to the screen, uh, to the to the front. Thank you. <clears throat> so Sarah Dickinson is going to talk about um, CDNS. Um, Sarah doesn't actually work at ICANN, so she's the odd one out today. But she's done work on behalf of ICANN um, on CDNS and Seaboard. Floor is yours. Thank you, Roy. OK, how's that level on this mic? OK, good. Right. So today I'm going to talk about something that's mentioned a couple of times already this morning, and that's a new format for DNS packet capture. Um, the agenda, quickly, is I'm going to talk about why we decided to actually develop a new format, some of the key design decisions we made along the way, um, and then I'll actually go into the details of the format itself. And we had to give it an acronym, so we called it Compressed CDNS. Um, compressed DNS, Compacted DNS, beg your pardon. Um, I'll mention the standardization effort that's going on around this in the DNS op working group. And then I'll briefly talk about the implementation status. OK, so why does packet capture get done? Well, there's um, general traffic analysis, obviously. Um, there's also wanting to detect uh, attacks in real time. Um, and what we also saw this morning from Roy was some very nice uh, post-event analysis. You want to be able to look at your logs and figure out what's going on. Um, and quite relevant for this uh, particular piece of work is that there are lots of community efforts where multiple operators want to contribute DNS traffic data, for example, DITL. Um, so if traffic capture is done today in DNS, there's a, a range of options. Um, you can go full Monty and capture PCAP files. There are a few DNS uh, packet capture tools around as well. So DNS tap is particularly popular. Um, DNS cap and packet queue are also available. Um, and as was mentioned earlier, there's also DSC, which is a tool which captures counts about packets, but not their uh, entire content. Um, but what's quite notable is that there is no standard format for DNS traffic capture exchange. So what happens by default is that people capture PCAPs and ship those around. However, in a PCAP, there's lots of information that isn't really directly relevant for the pure DNS traffic analysis. So you end up with unnecessarily large files if you do choose to capture PCAPs. Um, and that can be a particular problem if you're working in constrained environments. So there are a whole range of environments for doing packet capture. Um, but if you're in a case where your uh, server is third party hosted, where the capture tool has to run on the same hardware as the name server itself, and you are limited in the upload bandwidth that you have because you have the same connection for serving your DNS traffic and for uploading any capture files you have, then having to use full PCAPs can, can add quite a burden to doing this. Um, so I'll just quote Terry Manderson from the DNS engineering team here. Um, and his uh, view on this is that for something the size of LROOT, shipping PCAPs everywhere bites. He really doesn't like doing it. Um, it was just you know, causing too much burden on all the LROOT in instances. Um, so that's where the CDS project came from. As um, a little bit more background, which will be mentioned this morning. This work comes out of the DNS engineering team. Um, a few years ago, the DNS engineering team were involved in the creation of DNS Stats, which is a covering entity um, for the development of open source software for DNS statistics gathering and presenting. Um, and the Hedgehog tool that ICANN currently use came out of that work, um, and Synodon did that work for ICANN. Um, now, again, it's already been mentioned this morning, LROOT is, is quite unusual. It has um, 
over 150 Anycast instances, and its traffic level is 7 billion queries per day. And many of these are hosted by third parties. Now, historically, what the engineering team have done is use a combination of um, DSC XML files um, to feed data into Hedgehog, and then at the other end of the spectrum, also capture full PCAPs for their traffic analysis. But with the size of their system, they felt that that didn't really scale, and they wanted to find a much more general purpose solution that would scale to their needs. Um, so to develop something new that's going to be useful in the general case, you really have to target the, the most limiting use case um, if you want something to be feasible. So what we did when we thought about this project is we said, OK, let's think about targeting the environment where the data collection is happening on the same hardware as the name server. So in that case, you're constrained in your resources, most notably CPU and your upload bandwidth. Because at the end of the day, the job of this server is going to be to focus on serving DNS, not on capturing it. So you have to be able to control the resources consumed by any collection tool. Um, we also assumed that this data collection would at least temporarily rarely be stored on the same hardware until it got shipped off, so storage size is important there. And also that that upload might need to be throttled again because you're competing with DNS traffic. So taking those requirements into account um, and looking and tr trying to come up with the technical requirements in order of importance, we came out with the fact that the single most important thing in terms of looking at a new format was to minimize the file size, both for storage and for the upload case. But at the same time, you have to be mindful of the overhead of producing files of that size. So you know, we need to be thinking about how much CPU it takes to actually generate the files. The other thing that's really common is no matter how good a format you come up with, you're still probably going to win by additionally using a general purpose compression tool, something like GZIP or XZ, to further compress the files. So we very much wanted to look at the use case of end-to-end -to, -end to gathering the data to producing compressed files at the other end. The other thing that is a would be nice, really, is to be able to take that format and go back to PCAP. And one reason that's nice is that there are a lot of tools around today which consume PCAP. And if you can't go back to close to the original PCAP, then you lose the ability to feed the data into those tools. So, to move on to more specific design considerations that we took from, from this, we started off by thinking about DNS. It's a transactional protocol by its nature. Every query elicits a response. So the number one decision was to make the basic unit the combination of the query and its associated response. From that point, you then start thinking about, OK, what's the core set of data about a DNS transaction that you need to record. And we will state that we'll always, always record that subset of data. But we were very clear that we wanted the option to do everything from that minimal set up to full capture of both the query and the response. So we wanted the format to be very flexible in, in what you could store in it so that we could cater for the whole range of requirements um, the people who really wanted the smallest possible file size to those who were interested in being able to do the PCAP reconstruction. The next thing we started thinking about is that, about all the commonality between the information in DNS messages. Um, and what we realized is that if you take a set of DNS messages that happen over a given time period, there's an awful lot of pieces of data in there which are repeated. So for example, the client IP addresses. The queue names, those are the obvious bits of information that you can abstract out and index into from the individual query response items. So what we're really trying to do here is use our knowledge of DNS as a protocol to gain immediate compression inherent into the format itself. Um, so capturing DNS messages is all well and good, but there's some other information in traffic flows that's useful as well. Um, so importantly, we also wanted the format to support capturing information and metadata about what's going on, so ICMP messages, TCP resets, or at least information about them in terms of counts and addresses. Um, the other thing that 
obviously became clear is that if you're going to create some sort of structured format that you're going to use to compress DNS data, you're going to be limited in which DNS messages you can actually represent in that format because it is structured. So we also wanted to have a way to capture malform packets um, directly um, in terms of just being able to grab the whole of the wire format of the message in the malform case where we couldn't pass it enough to actually store it properly. Okay, so having figured out our general requirements, we then started thinking about what storage format do we use? And you know, there's a whole bunch of different binary representations out there that you can actually look at. Um, we looked at, I think, eight, but honed in on these three, Seabor, Apache Avro, and Protobuffers, which all have sort of slightly different properties in terms of how they do the storage. But going back to our first requirement, which was that the file size was going to be the key deciding factor here. What the first thing we did was we wrote some test tools and we got what we considered was some very average data from a root server. And we took each of these uh, binary representations and created output in a CDNS format and compared them in terms of their size. And we also ran them through general purpose compression tools, as I mentioned before, so that we could see uh, we were comparing the final product. And we were kind of surprised, actually, because we were like, well, one of these is surely going to be better than the other. And eh, not so much. It actually turns out there really is very little difference between these once you've run it through this whole process. Um, we were talking about sort of file size differences of the order of 5% was one of the biggest ones we saw. And what we saw in that case was that it took more resources to produce the file. So the trade-offs were really minimal in terms of file size storage at that point. So we went back and started saying, OK, then maybe some of the other attributes of these storage formats are actually what's going to be the thing that we need to think about. Um, so we, we pumped the Seaboard. And I'm going to talk about why we chose it as opposed to why we didn't choose the other ones. Um, the elevator pitch for Seaboard is it's binary JSON. What's not to like? That's good. Um, but that's a rather inaccurate statement, and it doesn't really do it justice, because it isn't exactly binary JSON, and it isn't only binary JSON. Um, one of the major reasons that we actually decided to use Seaboard is that it is an IETF standard. And given that a goal of this project was produced to get a format for DNS traffic standardized by the IETF, you get a big win if you're basing that on a format that's already a standard. Um, another interesting thing about Seaboard, which is really pure coincidence, <laughs> is that um, one of the authors of the Seaboard format is a DNS person. And they're sitting in this room today, and they work for ICANN, <laughs> Mr. Paul Hoffman. <laughs> So and we were chatting, and you said you never envisaged it being used to store DNS data um, when you actually developed it. But hey, here we are. Um, so one of the other things that really attracted us to Seaboard is that it is a really simple format. It's really elegant, and it's really easy to implement. And the other author of the Seaboard draft has stated that he reckons any half-decent developer can knock out a Seaboard encoder in an afternoon. It, it's that straightforward. Um, and testament is that today there are implementations of Seaboard encoders in 16 languages. It, you know, it's really widely implemented. And it is um, very nice to work with uh, at code level. Another attraction of Seaboard is that it has a data definition language, which is being standardized as well. So this means you have the opportunity in a human readable format to describe your format. And it, that's really quite a nice feature. And also, it converts nicely to JSON. So that's all good, too. OK, so I'm now going to go into some of the details of the format. Um, the draft that I mentioned has these pictures in them. And I'm not sure they're going to come out particularly well on this side of screen. So apologies for that. But if you are interested, um, if you Google DNS capture format draft, you can pull down the draft. And it contains these images uh, in SVG format as links in it. OK. So the conceptual overview of what's inside a CDNS file is at the top, you have a file ID and some preamble. So this is things like the format version. You can store information about what the configuration was and when you did the capture. You can put a host ID and things like that. 
Then inside it, you have repeating data blocks, um, which contain an N DNS query response items. And these data blocks are completely self-contained. They uh, contain all the information you need to describe the DNS message set that's, that is within it. Within each of these blocks, we have a start time, we have some statistics, and most importantly, we have what are called the block tables and the query response items. And on the next slide, I will dive into these in more detail. And then we have, as I mentioned, space to capture information about um, uh, ICMP and TCP resets. And after that, you would store malformed packets if you chose to. Um, so this doesn't come out very well at all. Um, uh, I'll try and walk you through it. <laughs> um, it looks like a mess of squiggly lines right now. But <laughs> um, if you consider just the minimal use case, which is you want to capture the minimum set of data, it, it looks like this. You start off with a single item per query response pair. And this item contains the distinguishing features of the query response pair, such as the time it arrived, the time the response went out, the client address and port it came from, transaction ID, and the queue name. Then when you start thinking about DNS messages, you realize there's a bunch of other data that actually reduces to a you know, limited set of members that will describe all of the DNS queries you get. And this information is things like the destination address. Was it going to the v4 or the v6 address? The transport flags. What, um, the DNS flags in it as well, and also things like the response code. And it turns out the number of these signatures is far less than the number of queries you get. So you're already winning by abstracting out this information. And the other information that you need for the minimal case is a table of all the IP addresses that were in there, which you index into from these two tables. The um, our data, so in this case, it's just the queue names. And then we've also pulled out the class and type, because there's a very small set of class type combinations in any DNS traffic flow. So, so that's all you have is five tables in that minimal case. If you decide you want to capture the information in the sections other than the uh, first question in the query, then you can do that. And in that case, we capture those sections. We create tables with lists of questions and the content of the um, RR type, and then those again then index off into the IP address and the data table and the class type table. So, so that's essentially the, the split in the representation. Okay. Um, just to very quickly show you, this is what the CDDL looks like for this. So it's really quite JSON-like and straightforward. So you give a type, you can easily say if something is optional, you can define other types here. So it's, it's really quite a nice straightforward way to represent it. Um, now, I mentioned that the basic unit here is the uh, query response item. And what that means is, in your collection software, you have to have a way to pair up your queries and your responses. Um, so in the IETF draft that describes this format, we have suggested a mechanism for doing uh, packet matching. Um, and you can't, probably can't see that at all, but it's a little flow chart to tell you how to um, uh, pull out uh, query response pairs. Uh, it's, it's very straightforward. It's basically you have a primary key um, involving the source and destination addresses, ports, the transport it came over, and the message ID. And you have a secondary key, which is the question. And the reason that's secondary is that, of course, um, in a DNS query, it is not prohibited to have no question. It, there isn't a lot of point in it, but it's not actually prohibited by the protocol. So that's possible. And also, if you get a malformed query, many implementations return a form error, but they don't include the question in the response. So your response might not have a question in it. Thank you. Um, and one little caveat to, well, that sounds easy, doesn't it, is that um, when you actually come to implement this, you discover that packet capture libraries um, don't actually guarantee to return packets in time order. And this is the point of the talk where I normally see 
people who have actually tried implementing packet matching algorithms nodding their head and going, yeah, I know, that sucks, doesn't it? Um, and what it means is you get some really nasty corner cases because you have to deal with things coming um, out of order. So that's just an implementation warning, but it's perfectly doable. So to move on to some actual results. So we took what we thought was a standard piece of traffic data from a root server, and we ran it through code to produce the CDNS output. Um, the first thing we looked at is, does this blocking really help what you're doing? So this graph has file size on the vertical axis and the block size, the number of DNS queries we block up together, um, on the horizontal axis. And what we found was the sweet spot lies somewhere between 5,000 and 10,000 queries in terms of giving you the uh, best file size for the effort of creating the block. Um, if you go above that, you don't actually get much smaller file sizes, and you consume a lot more resources, in particular memory, trying to do it. So that's kind of where you want to be. Um, and in terms of actually looking at the file sizes, our test data set was a PCAP, which was 660 megabytes. If you turn that into CDNS, it comes out at 75 megabytes. So you know, we, we've thrown away a bunch of information, so in a way that's not surprising. What we then do is we throw strong compression at this. Now, a PCAP will compress nicely because there is lots of repeated data in there, and that comes down to 49 megabytes. But you can still get value by compressing CDNS, and that reduces down to 18 megabytes. So the headline is really, on our standard data set, obviously this varies, typically what we saw is that the CDNS format was ballpark a third of the size of the full PCAP. But the other thing that you notice here is that when you look at what was the cost of doing that final step of compression, and we see that because the CDNS is already in a compressed format, it only takes you 25% of the CPU resources to compress CDNS compared to the comparable PCAP. So this um, uh, reaches those uh, goals of being a smaller size and of needing less resources to compress it as well. A um, couple of words on regenerating PCAPs. It can be done, but it is lossy. First of all, you might not capture the whole message. As I said, that's completely optional. We also can't reproduce IP fragmentation, TCP streams, uh, and we don't actually capture the content of the ICMP messages or the T TCP resets. Um, and something else which is a small span in the works is that if you want to try and reproduce the payload byte for byte, you will struggle unless you know the version and the, the name server software that sent you it because they do name compression in subtly different ways. Um, there's more about that in the draft. Okay, so last couple of slides. Um, what's happening with the draft? It was submitted to the DNSOP working group in October last year. Um, immediately it was submitted, there was actually an IPR disclosure against it which involved a patent application um, that was pending. Um, there haven't been any updates since that initial disclosure, so there's no movement on, on that front there. Um, the draft was subsequently adopted by the working group. We've done a couple of revisions. We think we've got the actual core format nailed down. There's a bit more work to do on malform packets, but we're hopeful it's in good shape. Implementation status. Um, we have running code, and it is deployed on the root server that LRoot operates, as you heard. Roy has been using that data. Um, we actually architected it slightly differently. We don't store the malform packets in CDNS format. What we did was we um, store what we can in the CDNS format, and we actually record all the other packets into a separate PCAP. We call them ignored PCAPs. And the reason we do this is that it means that if you then converted the CDNS back to PCAP and merged it with this file, you'd have a pretty good representation of the original traffic stream. So to summarize, we've worked on a new traffic capture format, um, and that's moving forward through the IETF to become a proposed standard. We do see significant file size savings over PCAP, um, and you can go back to PCAP in a lossy fashion if that's what you want to do. Um, so the next step, so obviously now we have this CDNS format, is to consume that directly rather than going back to PCAP 
So have something that can read that in and do the analysis and also visualization and all the sort of research stuff that Roy would like to have uh, happen. Um, so that's everything. Uh, thank you for your time. And I think we have a few minutes for questions. Hi, Dwayne from VeriSign. Um, thanks, Sarah. So um, you talked a lot about the, the, the format and the stuff. Do you have any tools or libraries that you're making available at this point um, for people? So the, the intention is to make open source what we've done. Um, so we have a uh, tool which will do the capture for you into CDNS. And we also have a tool that will take the CDNS and do the PCAP reconstruction. Um, I don't know exactly when that's going to be open source. Um, it's probably a better question to direct to Terry Manderson, who unfortunately okay. isn't here. But yeah, okay. the intention is absolutely to open source it through GNS stats. OK. And can I ask one more question? Um, um, so you talked about the um, you know, grouping queries and responses together. Yeah. So um, how does it work if you have a query without a response or a response without a query? OK. So um, we still store them, and it's just that um, some of the data will be missing. So the information in blue on here is what might not be present okay. if you're just storing a query by itself in this format or just a response. Um, so it, and it, it, in some cases, it does look a little odd if you've got a lot of malformed traffic coming in and you get a lot of um, form error responses. Because obviously, we can store the response in here, but we can't necessarily store the query. So we do, part of the statistics is the counts of the unmatched queries and responses in here. OK, thanks. Sarah, thank you. Alex from Nick.at. AT. Um, I was wondering, I should probably have left the draft, but um, is there some kind of extension mechanism in the in CDNS as well? I'm, I'm mostly interested in extension mechanism on the statistics um, storage. Yeah. So sorry, I should have mentioned this, actually. Um, one of the really nice things about the CBOR format is that it's, it's self-describing and also extensible. So it's uh, trivial to add your own field in if you want to customize it. And also, um, it's very easy to extend it if we want to add new things into this. So that, that's, that was another big reason for, for choosing CBOR, because it was, it was designed to be extensible. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. Um, I'm going to cut the line after the next question. Greg Chules, 3UK. Um, do you envisage this being used as, as a sort of one-off batch collection and then offline analysis, or as continuous collection on servers? Both. So, that, that, so at the moment, it's, it's batch. We sort of uh, uh, collect these files, ship them off somewhere, and then they're used for uh, post-event analysis. But what we'd really like to see is an almost real-time feed that can consume this and, and display, do display and analysis in real time. Yeah, I'm, I'm potentially interested in sort of continuous data analysis on busy recursive servers, for example, yeah. a bit like um, NetFlow or DNS. Right, yeah, yeah. Perfect. Thank you, Sarah. Um, before we go to our next speaker, um, if we can get that slide on the screen. Um, a couple of um, people have asked if these slides will be available. Uh, the answer is yes. Um, we will put a um, slide on the screen any moment now that has a temporary URL. Um, and on Monday, we're going to put them on the ICANN.org slash IDS, sorry, um, yes, slash IDS page. So all the presentations will be available. And they are now temporarily available on this Google Drive. So if you use this, 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 um, this URL, you will find them. I'm going to leave it on the screen for a couple of seconds. Um,